Okay, well, welcome to the final session of our 2023 uh, Brown Bagger webinar series brought to you by uh, the Extension team from the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium. I'm your host, Matt Spangler, faculty member at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and along with my colleagues, Bob Weber from Kansas State University and Dare Bullock from the University of Kentucky. Uh, we're very pleased to have you join us uh, today and, and throughout um, uh, the Wednesdays this October um, for this webinar series. If you've not already done so, certainly encourage you to visit uh, the website nbcec.org where you can find past recordings of uh, the Brown Bagger webinar series going back uh, in past years as well as find the third edition of our sire selection manual. Um, obviously these webinars as well as that manual uh, made really for uh, cattle producers, um, beef breed association technical staff, uh, as well as extension personnel um, in mind. So today we actually have three speakers, and the first of which is Dr. Troy Rowan, who's an assistant professor and extension specialist at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Troy grew up on a, a purebred Charlet operation in Iowa. He received his PhD from the University of Missouri, and currently his research and extension programs focus on heterosis and crossbreeding, genetic selection for improved cow efficiency, and genotype imputation. And today, Troy is going to give us a primer on low pass sequencing and imputation for genetic evaluation. And with that, Troy, uh, thank you very much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to to talk a little bit about this, Matt. Um, uh, a uh, um, a topic that I've I've done some research work in, but I, I think is becoming a little bit more, um, I guess, ready for action in the beef cattle evaluation space. Um, lots of breed associations and folks thinking about this. Um, so I really wanted to give today a, a basic primer, um, introduce some of these concepts, some of these words that get thrown around, um, around low pass sequencing, how it might fit into a genetic evaluation context, um, but, but particularly set the stage maybe for the genomic prediction workshop, um, which will, will happen in Kansas City this December, where we'll, we'll dive into all of these things in some, some more depth. But um, with that, I'll, I'll sort of jump right into things. And, and ultimately, right, just so we're on the same page, I want to set the stage and talk about DNA variants, right? So these mutations, um, however you want to talk about them, are, are ultimately what drive all of the genetic variation that exists within these populations. Um, any genetic variation that we can select on, um, that an EPD represents, all of that ultimately is driven by mutations in the DNA. These can come in the form of single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, we call these SNPs, of course. Um, knowing that 99.9% .9 of these um, of these genomes, our search from a genomic perspective is on these variations, and being able to go in and capture those, of course, enables us to to utilize them in in genomic evaluations. Um, we also have indels, um, so as opposed to a single nucleotide change, um, a substantial. Um, insertion or a deletion, um, again, depending whether you are looking at it from the perspective of the, the top or bottom sequence, that's either an insertion or a deletion um, that's multi-base pairs long, but, but not ginormous, right? So um, these are two things that are captured by our, our SNP chips that we have. Um, so those array-based genotyping tools are able to capture both SNPs and indels. So we start to think about larger um, structural variations um, big copy number variants um, in, in, I guess, just sort of larger sized variants. Um, those are a little bit harder for us to, uh, to genotype with these array-based technologies um, and something that we'll, we'll get to in the context of, of low-pass sequencing here in a second. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind, too, is, is as we think about the number of variants that exist, um, this is all relative to the population in which we're looking, right? If we look um, at the number of, of DNA differences between two individuals 
from the same population. Um, that could be a fairly modest number of variants, whereas if we look across um, both subspecies of, of boss animals, right, we're going to find a lot more DNA differences that exist, right? Most of these are going to be very, very rare. Um, so they'll only occur in a handful of, of animals or, um, you know, most commonly probably only one animal, right? And so as we think about all of this genetic diversity and trying to capture it with our tools, um, it's it's important to keep in mind that that's all relevant or it's relative rather to the the population and the animals in which we're we're looking at these things. And so, starting out, I think it's helpful before we jump into to low pass sequencing to talk just a little bit about our our present methods for SNP chip genotyping, right? And basically what SNP chips did is they were able to give us a, a reduced representation look at the, the beef cattle genome, right? So of the 3 billion base pairs in, in say within a population, there's maybe 30 million um, SNPs or, or small indels, right? We know that because DNA is inherited in haplotypes, that we don't need to represent every single base pair of the genome in order to get a, a more quantitative picture of, of how animals relate to one another on a, a DNA sharing basis. And so what we do is we intentionally find markers, um, polymorphisms in the genome that are, are evenly spaced, right? We want to we want to capture as much of the genome um, as, as possible from just a real estate perspective. They need to be relatively high um, minor allele frequency. So these, these need to have um, some sort of variation, a, a marker that isn't uh, um, that doesn't have any variation across animals isn't useful to us in a, in a genetic context of, of either estimating an effect of an allele substitution or in utilizing that information um, to help better resolve relationships between animals. And so the way that we do this, right, or the way that we did this was um, went found places in the genome that were polymorphic, evenly spaced, um, and, and were at a, a relatively high allele frequency. We designed these probes, right? So these are going to map to that very specific area of the genome. And then using one base pair extensions um, and immunofluorescence, we're able to, um, on a sequencer, say, you know, this is the, the SNP at position X. Um, it adds a, a green fluorescing base um, to the end of it. Right, we can we can call that genotype as a um, as a C, right, due to the intensity of those lights, and and from a from a genetic evaluation standpoint, the you know somewhere between twenty and a hundred thousand SNPs that are on these array based genotyping um, platforms are good enough resolution for us to to either build a G matrix um, for single step GBLUP or um, rather an H matrix for for single step or to to go in and and, and estimate marker effects in a, a super hybrid um, marker effects model right so these things have have been the workhorse for the long term um, but again a reduced representation of the diversity that exists throughout the 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 beef cattle genome and so as we jump into what low pass sequencing is I think it's helpful first to just talk about what sequencing is um, Low pass is no different, really, than what we're doing when we're going and doing high coverage resequencing of, of animals. So um, just a little bit of, of background here. We a lot of times will call this shotgun sequencing, um, and it really is just uh, about exactly like it sounds. We break the genome up into a whole bunch of little chunks, and then from there, we go through and, and read across those chunks and, and try and put it back together. So first, before we start resequencing lots of animals, we have to make uh, sort of one genome to rule them all. Um, we call this a, a reference genome. The way that reference genomes get built, um, and this is a, a way, way oversimplification for anyone who has, has done genome assembly. It's a, a very challenging, difficult, um, and important step in all of this. But effectively, we break the chunk in the genome into chunks. We use DNA sequencing to read these chunks. Um, typically, modern um, platforms, if we're thinking about uh, we short read and long reads, um, short reads, which is going to be the vast majority of sequencing that happens at the at the commercial scale at this moment. These are somewhere between 100 and 200 base pair long chunks of the genome that are are being read by these sequencers. Once we've we've gotten all these little chunks of DNA, right, um, 100 to 200 base pairs long, we have to figure out where they relate to one another, right? We need to find those little bits of overlap. 
um, and assemble them into a, a linear representation of the genome, right? And so there's there's lots of, of very complex algorithms and, and methods for doing sequence assembly, but effectively what we're left with once we've overlaid all these, um, the little bits, because this is random, we have enough overlap that we're able to assemble these into a, a linear representation of the genome. In this reference genome, um, so in the case of, of cattle, it's a, a line one Herford called Dominette. She acts as the, the backbone for all of our future sequencing efforts. So instead of having to go through and de novo assemble every genome for every animal that we go out and sequence, we have a, a reference point that we can use to, to say, hey, this is probably where this chunk goes as we try and piece together all the reads from, from other individual genomes. So again, um, a very similar start to how we would build a reference genome. We, we break the, G, the DNA of animals into lots of small chunks. We read through these with our, our 100 to 200 base pair long reads. And because we don't have to de novo a symbol, we can just align these back to the reference genome, right? So saying, hey, we're this 150 base pair segment most likely belongs here based on the linear representation of Dominet's genome. And then once we've we've aligned our reads, we can start to identify SNPs or, or individual base pairs within those reads that differ compared to this linear reference in the form of Dominet. And that's what we call calling SNPs, right? And so as we as we think about this, um, I think it's it's helpful to to first think about coverage, right? This is a completely random process. Um, where this DNA is getting broken up into, um, what areas are covered by more reads than others. And so in reality, what you see is that when we, we throw all of these reads back onto our reference genome, there's some variation in the depth of coverage as we look across, right? Um, some areas are covered by up to five reads. Other areas might only have a single read. And so the way that we're able to calculate coverage, again, this is on a, a genome-wide average scale, not a site-by-site -site basis, right? So we just take the number of reads times the length of read divided by our genome size. Um, if, you're, if you're doing 30 million reads um, on a genome that's um, only a billion base pairs, um, that's very different than doing the same number of reads on a 3 um, billion base pair genome like cattle. So again, scaling all of this um, by the number of reads, how long they are in the genome size. And this is when we talk about coverage, um, what we're talking about. And so the, the confidence with which we're able to call SNPs in these, in these reads is dependent on the number of, of reads that cover a particular site. And, and hopefully that will, um, that will be evident here in, in my little example. But, but again, as we go through and we attempt to call SNPs, right, find polymorphisms in the genome, the more coverage that we have at a site, the more confident we are um, that there's a, a true variant there compared back to the linear reference um, that, that Dominet has. So again, in, in my example here, we've got a little section of the genome um, where there's, there's possibly a, a mutation. And as we add more reads, um, that didn't work um, like I expected. We had some, some reformatting happen there, I guess. Um, but the um, this all should line up, but it, it didn't as I, oh, and it's going crazy now. Um, but basically, as we add additional reads to the um, to our, our resequencing pool here, right, and we line these up, we know that this belongs here. Um, this site likely, because of all the matching on either side, um, matches this spot with a single read. We're not super confident when we see an A at this position that's a T in that reference genome. We're not super confident whether that's just a sequencing error. Um, so the sequencing process is not perfect. Um, sometimes it'll it'll put the wrong base pair in. Um, and so we're we're not certain if that's a true variant, right? Is this an AT SNP or is that just a sequencing error? And so as we go on and we add more um, add more reads to that particular site, um, again, in genome wide, our, our coverage is going up to to coincide with that. If we saw only T's show up here, we might say that this is probably just a sequencing error in that first read. Um, what my, my messed up formatting here on the slide did um, is cut off the subsequent reads that show that there's, um, there's A's in half of those reads 
indicating that that's probably a heterozygous site um, when we go and actually call a variant there. So um, again, our confidence, the confidence with which these genotype calling algorithms work um, will increase with the number of, of times that that read is, is covering, um, the number of reads that cover that particular site. And so when we think about low pass sequencing, it's it's just the same as, as normal sequencing, but the number, the amount of coverage, the number of reads that we have um, covering sites in the genome on average is, is much lower. Um, so in, in this case, right, you'll see that much of the genome doesn't even get a single read, right? But because this is random, um, there will be some places in the genome that get multiple reads, right? We can pretty confidently probably call a SNP that exists here, um, but over here, it's it's anybody's guess, right? And so, uh, again, much of the genome is not going to get covered by a read, uh, but there's going to be sufficient depth in some places for us to call reads. And that by itself is not particularly useful, right? So this is a um, an example of a, a low pass sequencing run, maybe where we, we accurately call these letters in this, um, what I would say is a, a very catchy and, and iconic song here in, in the state of Tennessee. Um, but we're going to have trouble piecing together the full picture of what this is, right? Same thing in a cattle genome, right? Knowing these handful of letters might give us a little bit of an idea, but it's probably not representative of, of what the full um, suite of, of mutations might be that we're able to call if we were to have, say, a, a high coverage genome, right, where we're confidently able to call each of those variants because um, we have so many reads covering everywhere on uh, um, across that across the genome, right? So again, um, this can either be done by sequencing um, at much, much higher coverage, which is obviously expensive, or we can utilize imputation. And, and that's what's happening at the commercial scale now, um, taking these low pass, um, low coverage genomes and utilizing imputation to fill in the missing pieces, right? So I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about what imputation is. Um, this example, um, one of the, the better ones from a, a review paper back in 2010, um, this is using um, genotype SNP chips, but the same thing sort of goes for, um, for low pass, right? But instead of these actual typed variants being at a consistent spot in the genome, they're going to be a little bit more randomly distributed um, just based on, on what places uh, received higher coverage over, um, over the course of its sequencing, right? So here we've got lots of missing data. We do have some genotypes that we're able to call confidently. We can utilize a reference set of individuals who have high coverage, high confidence genotypes, right? So these might be animals that are sequenced at high coverage. These are animals that have SNP chip genotypes. We can phase these so we can um, guess which haplotypes each of these belong to, and then go back to this reference set of haplotypes and fill in the missing uh, places in the genome utilizing imputation algorithms. What you're left with is, is sort of a consistent set of genotypes, right? We've computationally inferred our missing genotypes, and what it allows us to do with this higher resolution is possibly pick up SNPs that are either causal um, or in, in perfect LD with the causal variant. Um, that we would have missed if we were just using that unimputed data. Um, just kind of a, a couple nuts and bolts of sequencing data. Um, so what comes off of the sequencer um, is going to be what we call a fast Q file. Um, and this is basically exactly what the sequencer has read um, for each one of those individual um, chunks that we gave it at the, at the front end, right? So A's, C's, T's, and G's all the way across, right? This is going to be a large file, a very dense file, because every single read, um, say we've done, you know, a few million reads um, times 150 letters per read times however many animals we've gone in low pass sequenced. Um, that's a large amount of data for us. After imputation, though, um, the file size actually, um, the file size, the useful file size actually goes down as we're utilizing these variant call format files. Um, so these VCF files, as we call them, um, are going to have position information, right, where we've called SNPs and where the imputation has, has either filled in or the, the genotype was, was sufficient to be called with high quality. This will give us information on, on positions, chromosomes, um, as well as reference and, and alternative alleles, lots of quality information. So not all of our imputation is, is going to be high confidence coming off the, um, out of the imputation algorithm. 
we're able to, to come in here and not only know the genotype, but also quality associated with how confident we are um, that that imputed genotype is, is what we think it is, right? Um, so, so again, this is going to be a smaller file, lots of variants, but we're not getting all of the, the common stuff um, that would come in in this individual reads in the form of a FASTQ. And so as we, we think about imputation, this is a, an example that I always give um, comparing the same region, the same GWAS, and the same population, utilizing a SNP50 um, density of markers, right? So these are all the markers that are on the SNP50. And then these same markers, um, but imputed to sequence level density. And so you can see as we're, we're doing these association studies, trying to find places in the genome that are associated with a particular phenotype, we would completely miss this association if we were just using a SNP50, um, but we see a, a really complex uh, structure of possible mutations that maybe are, are playing into this complex phenotype when we look at the sequence imputed data. And you can think about ways that this impacts genomic prediction and genetic evaluations um, by if we can find um, and, and utilize appropriately these mutations that are, are more likely to be associated with that causal mutation rather than our, our evenly spaced high minor allele frequency variants um, that has the potential um, to, to help us do a better job of, of genomic prediction at the end of the day. The, the important thing that I'll sort of end on here is that in order for imputation to be accurate, in order for us to be confident that those imputed sites um, in low pass are, um, are imputed correctly, we have to have a, a very robust, large reference set of haplotypes. So these are animals that are sequenced at, at high enough coverage um, that we can confidently call their, their genotypes at the sequence level. And so uh, again, having that is, is essential um, imputation tends to be pretty accurate, particularly as we look at more common variants, right? So these are our minor allele frequencies versus imputation quality. Um, these are to the, the high chip density level. Um, these would be low pass genotypes, um, not an apples to apples comparison. Um, but generally, right, if you're a moderate minor allele frequency SNP, um, basically anything above 0.1, we do a really good job of imputing those SNPs with an appropriate reference, right? Where we, we lose some ground are on these rare variants, um, so variants with minor allele frequencies less than 5%, um, the imputation quality tends to fall off a little bit there. Um, let's skip through a whole bunch. Um, but, but one of the biggest things that we found um, that helps impact that end imputation quality is building a, a large multi-breed reference panel. So especially in breeds that have open herd books, borrowing haplotype information from other animals, um, animals of other breeds, animals that maybe have influence in that herd book um, can really do a, a good job of, of helping um, lowly imputed animals gain some imputation accuracy. Um, you'll see here the, the purple line, our multi-breed reference versus the, the within breed reference. Um, this is in a set of Gelvy animals. Um, but probably easier to, um, to visualize on an individual basis. So these are, are something like 50 Gelvy animals um, imputed using a, a breed reference that was only made up of Gelvies, and then using a, a composite imputation reference made up of animals of uh, a variety of different breeds. What you see is that animals that get imputed well in the breed-specific reference, you don't see a lot of change when you move to a, a composite reference, but these poorly imputed imputed individuals, um, you actually see quite a substantial reduction in the number of total imputation errors when you're giving them access to more reference haplotypes, right? So this these might be balancer typed animals who gaining access to all of the Angus animals in a, an imputation reference really helps us more confidently infer those missing genotypes. Um, and I'm going to skip to this last little bit because I know I'm, I'm right up on time. But the important thing and in, in the thing that I think in the genetic evaluation space that we need to think about, um, I know that Matt's group has, has done a lot of really neat work in, in this area, um, but how do we utilize this extra data in the form of, of sequence level imputed genotypes? So 
instead of getting those 50 to 100,000 SNPs back, we have the potential to deliver up to a million uh, or up to 30 million rather um, variants in this imputed data set. So there's a number of ways that I see that we can move forward with this. Um, one, and I think the way that uh, probably in the immediate term we'll utilize this low pass data um, is just extracting the same markers from the imputed set that we would use with our SNP chips, right? So this might be a core set of, of 50,000 variants um, that we can build a, a, a G matrix or an H matrix with. Um, the, the set of SNPs that we've maybe identified in our marker effects model. Um, but again, this allows us to immediately merge these low pass um, and chip genotypes as we sort of phase into the, the low pass world. Um, but there's not a ton of extra value that gets extracted from this, this low pass genotype at that state, right? Um, we have to, I think, utilize these in, in some different way. Um, one approach is to just if 50,000 is good, 30 million is better. Um, but there's been limited evidence that shows that this actually helps in the context of a, a single step evaluation, right? Um, we're capturing most of our genetic variants with, with those 50,000 SNPs on the chip. Um, and that's sufficient for genomic prediction. We don't see a ton um, of accuracy increase by, by just throwing more variants at it. But I think the, the area where we'll, we'll see some improvement um, will be in prioritizing variants. So finding biologically important variants. So whether or not these are, are truly causal um, or if they, they're tied to some sort of, of functional mutation, something that, um, that changes a, a molecular process, right? Um, these technically, you know, in theory, if we're able to um, draw from some non-normal variant effect distributions, um, these have an opportunity, I think, to, to help us do prediction better or um, even if they don't improve prediction accuracy, make the portability of, of predictions across breeds um, a, a little bit more straightforward. So um, with that, I'll leave you with a couple takeaways, my, my contact information there, and I'll, I'll answer questions if, if anybody has them. So um, appreciate the NBCEC for, for having me on to talk about this. Um, I think it'll be more relevant as we keep moving forward. So with that, I'll turn over control um, and answer questions if we've got them. Thank you, Troy. Uh, very nicely done. I'd remind the uh, audience, if you do have questions, please put them into the uh, Q&A box and, and we can handle those now. Or I know Troy for sure will be hanging around to the end um, because he's going to wrap us up today. And, and so I'm confident he'd be happy to take them then as well. Um, maybe just as we're, we're transitioning here, Troy, uh, a question for you relative to entities that are going to build this reference set that you mentioned, um, there could arguably be a lot of animals in common amongst all the organizations that want to build a reference set. I think of uh, heavily used Angus sires, an example. Um, what's your vision for, for that? Does everybody need to sequence the same bulls? Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great question, Matt, and something that we're going to have to grapple with um, together across genotyping providers and breed associations and academic groups. Um, there certainly, I, I think, some of those foundational Angus sires. There's no reason for us to be sequencing them five or six times, right? From a from a resource allocation standpoint, uh, I think it's always going to be better if we can can do these things in a in a collaborative manner. Um, I understand that that's um, that's maybe my my academic self talking, but um, if we're able to 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 pool resources, I think um, there's no marginal decrease um, when you add more different animals in. Right, sample more haplotypes, and you'll you'll do a better job of imputation. So if we can avoid the replication of of sequencing of animals. Um, I think that gives us an opportunity to to more deeply sample the um, the haplotypes across the population. So, um, what that what that looks like in practice, um, I, I think, is something that that BIF and and NBCEC and and breed associations and industry groups will will have to come together um, and and see where we can find some common ground and and maybe devote some resources towards uh, towards making that that big public uh, public access object that it help everybody out equally. So. Great. Thank you, Troy. Um, again, uh, 
if you have questions, please use the, the Q&A box to, to do that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move on to our, our next uh, speaker. So we decided to have the next two speakers as part of what we call uh, kind of our, our new geneticist spotlight. These are uh, two folks just beginning their academic career. Not that Troy's been around for a long time. He's relatively new in position as well. Uh, but we wanted this to serve as a means of introducing uh, some uh, new uh, extension specialists uh, to this audience. And so the first of, of those two is Dr. Jamie Quarter, who uh, is a North Carolina native, uh, received her bachelor's degree at North Carolina State, uh, and then subsequently pursued a master's degree at South Dakota State University and finished her PhD here at the University of Nebraska, working with a close colleague of mine, Dr. Ron Lewis. After she completed her PhD, she spent five years as a product manager and technical services manager for Neogen uh, here in Lincoln. Um, and very recently, September 1st of this year, she accepted a position as the beef genetics beef genetics genetics extension specialist at the University of Missouri. Um, so welcome uh, to this audience, Jamie, uh, and we look forward to hearing uh, a little bit more about your background, interests, and role. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Spengler. Um, it's funny to go from being on the audience side to the speaker side for the first time. So I've watched this presentation and webinar series for quite a few years. Um, let's see. There we go. So um, Dr. Spangler did, Spangler did do a good job of introducing me. Like he said, I'm originally from North Carolina, but I've been in the Midwest for about 10 years now. Um, I, we moved to Missouri on August the 7th, and I started on September the 1st. So I don't know how much I can really do. Uh, divulge out as far as my research and extension kind of goals and objectives, but we're going to give it a try. Um, in this picture here, though, is my husband, Donnie, and then my son, Wyatt, who is, um, he'll be two in January, and then we are expecting baby number two here any day now. So lots of exciting things in the quarter household. A little bit about my thesis research. So I actually conducted it down at the Media Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska with Mark Tolman and Larry Keene. And this was back before single step came out, back when we were still using the blending method to calculate um, genomically enhanced EPDs. And so back then, there was this idea of when we use genetics and, and DNA on animals within a prediction or a training population, and then we have closely related animals within the, basically that the application or the, the population we're trying to create new predictions in, there's a little bit of a winner's curse or discovery bias in their accuracy. And so the idea that because there's shared DNA between the training and the predicting population of animals um, does, or we've showed that it would increase the accuracy um, of that prediction. And so we were looking at ways to mitigate that. Following that, though, um, I moved more into my passions kind of do, developed towards more of an applied research program. And so in my PhD and my time at the University of Nebraska with Dr. Lewis, we looked at subjective measures that cattlemen currently use to quantify docility or temperament, um, be it shoot score, exit score, and exit velocity, and some other um, metabolic measurements and things like that. But just looking at how indicative they are of true physiological stress and whether they change over time. Um, so I do have quite a few publications out of that, but that was definitely more of an applied research program. Um, and that's where my real extension kind of passions and, and desires for teaching and things like that kind of developed. So when I graduated, I was applying or when I was coming up to graduation, I applied for jobs that were at universities but had an extension or a teaching role. And when Neogen posted their product product manager description, it really read like an extension professional, but just for Neogen. So my job there was to be the conduit between Neogen's research and development team and then their sales team and obviously the, the cattle industry as a whole. So, you know, if R&D comes up with an idea or a new product, 
How are we going to translate those results to producers in a way that's easy to understand um, or, or, you know, easy to adopt? And so that's what I spent a large majority of my time doing, um, as well as helping to market those products. But really a lot of my time, just because we are where we are in the adoption of genomic technology, was put into showing the importance of genomic testing, both at the seed stock and commercial levels. Um, what's the importance of buying a bull with a genomically enhanced EPD? What's the importance of using genomics to help, you know, as a tool with replacement heifer selection, things like that. And so, you know, it really did cater to my interests um, and passions. And as Neogen kind of did a, a revamp of their bovine team, um, that was an easy transition for me into what they call technical services. So a little bit more on the data analysis and R&D side, but still doing some genetic consulting on the use of genomic products, um, summary of data, you know, are the products effective and things like that. I did have a lot of educational opportunities at Neogen, um, and they took a lot of different forms. So be it in formal product launches and training the sales team on what the product did, how it impacted the cattlemen um, and its importance. We did a lot of webinars for industry shared with, you know, a lot of, of members on this call um, and also breed associations and things like that. Um, it included live presentations at association conventions, industry articles. I mean, you name it. I mean, my role again was very heavily just how do we increase the adoption of genomic technology? So when I kind of learned of the role that was posted at the University of Missouri, it was natural kind of for me to, to say, you know, this is something that, that I would be willing to pursue. And so my position today is 60% extension and 40% research. Um, and so again, the largely an extension role driving the, the beef genetics curriculum for the state of Missouri. And for those who know the state of Missouri um, and the programs that they have here, that includes involvement in their Show Me Select replacement heifer program, as well as being the, the, the primary genetics kind of expert for their developing National Center for Applied Reproduction and Genomics. Alongside that, like Dr. Spengler said, I've been here since September 1st, so we're on month two and I'm about to head out on maternity leave. But what I've been trying to get the ball rolling on in these first two months has been first and foremost, and the cow herd here at the University of Missouri is separated over six different commercial herds, all of varying size and breed makeup, everything from commercial Angus to, um, to commercial Red Angus, Sim Angus, there's some baldy herds here. Um, and so just trying to get a more formal breeding objective and crossbreeding plan um, for those different herds. And so we're working on enrolling that cow herd into American Simmental's, you know, level D cow herd roundup total herd enrollment program. Um, because this is really going to be where the base of my extension program um, and, and the use of this information for the state specialists for field days and all of that kind of begins. Um, so we'll get back those, those genetic predictions um, to help us define breeding objectives, design formal crossbreeding programs, and then help these extension professionals really show the value of genomics um, to, this, to producers in the state of Missouri. Along with that, um, Right around the time that this position became um, vacant, uh, Show Me Select launched a program called Show Me Plus. And that is just, so if you know Show Me Select, basically there's tier one. These animal heifers have passed all of these different tests for, for um, fertility and pregnancy and things like that. Then there's tier two where they're sired by an influential AI sire. Um, but then Show Me Plus is a designation that's a part of the program where these females have genomic tests on file. So whether that be a genomically enhanced EPD through because they're a registered heifer or any type of commercial genomic testing. And there's really been no education or drive around that level of the program. And so I'm hoping to be able to increase um, enrollment and, and understanding of the value that that brings to, to the heifer purchaser. 
as far as my research program, again, um, it's really kind of under construction. I would say that the theme is going to be showing the value of genetics and genomics as a tool to increase producer profitability at both the seed stock and the commercial level um, with two primary interests, you know, for now, obviously those grow and change over time, um, but showing the value of crossbreeding and heterosis um, and how that can impact producer profitability. And then I'm actually in the works on um, doing a commercial genomic testing trial so we're going to um, take DNA samples on the cow herd here and look at and compare the efficacy of um, Zoetis' Inherit Select and Neogen's Igenity Beef um, and kind of come up with, you know, do these products work? What is our formal use case and recommendations as it goes along with commercial genomic testing? Um, and so those are kind of the two themes and interests for now. Um, there's obviously collaboration with other faculty here, here at MU. And then I've been in discussions with some of the people on this call as well about ideas and, and ways that we can work together. So with that, Dr. Spangler, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. And so for those uh, on, on this webinar, uh, from Missouri or uh, perhaps even surrounding states, right? If you have a question uh, about beef cattle genetics, now you know the person in that role uh, to go to. And so certainly hope you take it, advantage of that. Um, if there are any questions, again, for any of our speakers, please put them in the, the Q&A box. Um, but perhaps um, for now, and we can circle back to any questions towards the end, we'll move on to our second uh, new geneticist spotlight who's been in in her position perhaps a bit longer than than uh, Jamie has but uh, certainly hasn't been there long and that's Dr. Randy Colbertson who's a native of New Mexico where she grew up on a, a cattle ranch received her bachelor's degree from New Mexico or yeah bachelor's degree from New Mexico State and then master's and PhD from Colorado State and following her PhD uh, she uh, accepted the role as the lead geneticist at the American Simmental Association and the International Genetic Solutions uh, Multi-Breed Genetic Evaluation and served in that role from 2019 to 2022. And then about a year ago, November of 2022, she moved to Iowa, where she is now the cow-calf extension specialist and a beef geneticist at Iowa State University. Um, so certainly uh, glad to have you on here, Randy, and, and you have been on this webinar before in your previous role with the American Simmental Association. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, as Matt said, I um, I have been on the Brown Bagger before, um, so but in a different role. So I'm glad to be on today to uh, discuss what's going on here at Iowa. Okay, so um, so like Matt said, I am just I'm a week shy of being here at Iowa State. By uh, you know, I started November first of last year. Uh, moved from Montana to here. Was, I've grown up in the West my entire life, so the running joke is when somebody tells me to go north, I have no idea where that is. I have to look it up on a map or use Google Maps to get around the state, but slowly getting my bearings here. Um, so I am um, an assistant professor here on campus and I'm also the cow-calf extension specialist. Um, I have a split, I have a 60% extension appointment, 20% research, 15% teaching and a 5% institutional service. And so you'll notice though my largest appointment is with extension and one of the um, one of the advantages of coming here to Iowa State was the opportunity to work with the Iowa Beef Center. So the Iowa Beef Center was established in 96, and it serves as the university's extension program for cattle producers here in the state. And so um, it's a combination of the College of Ag. We work with the Vet Med and extension and outreach. And we work across disciplines as well as across departments to answer 
and address any producer um, questions or issues that they're facing. When I started here in November, um, it pretty much, there wasn't much time to get settled in. It was pretty much take off and go. It's a very, uh, the group here with the Beef Center, they're very productive. They've always got things going on. Um, one of the first things, um, you know, I got to work with our regional beef specialists. We got six specialists across the state. Um, Denise Schwab is our current interim department, or uh, director of the Beef Center. And, um, but I also get to work quite a bit with Patrick Wall, Chris Clark, Erica Wolfuck, Beth Doran, and Russ Yukin. And they basically are boots on the ground. Um, they've got a their region of the state where they put on quite a few meetings. And right now, since the harvest is in, we're starting to gear up for a bunch of winter meetings and my calendar's already starting to fill up with getting those meetings um, scheduled. So they are our regional specialists. We also have quite a few campus staff as well. Like I said, I'm the cow-calf specialist. We have a program specialist, Beth Reynolds. Uh, she's kind of air traffic control. She uh, organized, keeps us organized and keeps you know our programs kind of on track. We work with an ag economist, Lee Scholes, um, Dr. Garland Dalkey does our computer program. She's, he's a ruminant nutritionist. He runs the Brands program, which is used a lot for formulating diets. Um, he also um, he's also the programmer for the estra synchronization protocols that you might be familiar with through the uh, Beef Repro Task Force. We have two vets that we work with quite a bit: Dan Thompson and Grant Dewall. Um, Sherry Hoyer's in charge of communications. And then Dan Loy just recently retired in July. He was our feedlot extension specialist. He's been here at Iowa for a number of years. And so um, we will be looking to fill that position here this winter. So one of the first things that they had me do when I got here in November is in January, we went around to the areas of the state and we conducted listening sessions, so focus groups. So each one of our field specialists got a, um, a group of producers together and we just asked them, you know, what keeps you up at night? So they had uh, no qualms about telling us some of the issues that they are um, that they are faced with and what they see as issues as far as, you know, the things that keep them up at night and the things that they are challenged with for their day-to-day -day business. And the top four concerns were cattle marketing, land use and availability, herd health, and feed costs. So, you know, here I am, a quantitative geneticist, sitting down doing these focus groups. So what's the first thing I did was try to quantify this and put this in numbers so that it's a little easier for me personally to interpret. So uh, I had an abstract this last summer at ASAS where I quantified that. You can see here the four topics that were discussed in all six of the regions. Each star represents a time that this was brought up. And then as you can see with these other groups, we see that some like farm transition was more of a concern in the Northeast region, probably less of a concern in some of the other regions. For this group, since this is typically, you know, we typically talk about genetics, I thought I'd bring in our genetic tools. And that was brought up in about three of the regions, brought up about five times. Clearly I can't count, I have a small typo on this table. But the tools that were brought up were basically you know, what tools are available for bull selection? Um, you know, how do we manage mature cow size? And, you know, what tools are available for selection? So those were some of the concerns that were brought up from producers here in the state. So a lot of these uh, topics will be used going forward for some um, programs that we will be putting together going forward. But like I mentioned, you know, land use and availability was a big topic for a lot of our producers. Um, so that led me to start a conversation with our wildlife extension specialist 
to put together a uh, grant to look at grazing cattle on CRP. And um, so this grant as has been funded, it's a five-year collaborative grant. Um, so we're gonna, it's, we just got the funding for this. So this winter we'll be looking at trying to find producers who will want to participate it, in this study. And so we're gonna look at, you know, grazing cattle on CRP, um, what's the effect of that on wildlife, as well as water um, water quality and soil health. So, um, you know, not a big genetics project per se, but I do think this is gonna be a, a project that will be have a large impact for cattle producers here in the Midwest. And the irony of this is in January, I was in the back of a room Googling what the heck CRP was because I come from the West, so I'm used to uh, BLM land, federally and state-owned land. So this was a little bit of a uh, transition for me to deal with, to work with this. Um, as far as research goes, I um, have the opportunity to work with the McNay Research Herd here at Iowa State. It's a registered Angus herd. Um, this herd was traditionally, it was one of the reasons, I guess the reason why this herd is known is for the development of carcass ultrasound and validation of using carcass ultrasound for selection. And this herd has been heavily selected for marbling. It's pretty common for this group of herd to have quite a few prime calves come out uh, when we finish these, this herd. Um, my position was actually open for three years before I started here in November. So as far as data, we have data, it just hasn't been centralized and put into a database, which makes it difficult for doing some genetic type research. So we're in the process of rebuilding that, putting all that information together so that going forward, we can start to do more genetic research utilizing this herd. Currently, I do have a heifer development project that just started this month. It was funded by the Iowa Beef Industry Council, and we're going to be looking at using those carcass ultrasounds from weaned heifers all the way through breeding and confirmed pregnancy, kind of look at the variation of that as those heifers are developed. We're going to develop them on two different um, uh, planes of nutrition and see how that affects those carcass ultrasounds. And so I'm hoping that this will turn into more of a long-term selection um, research project. Um, one other thing that I am working, you know, moving towards is research in beef on dairy. We, I'm uniquely positioned here that we also have access to an ISU or Iowa State has a research dairy as well. So we're hoping to leverage the two herds to be able to do some more research in the area of beef on dairy. A lot of people here in Iowa are feeding beef on dairy crossed calves, and there's a lot of questions on how do we feed these calves? How do we breed and select bulls to be used in dairies for the development of these uh, feeder calves? So lots of questions there. I think we've got a good opportunity here at Iowa to really dive into this. So doing a lot of collaborative work with James Coltis, who's our dairy geneticist, and Gail Carpenter, who is our um, dairy extension specialist here. Um, and one last thing is my shameless plug. Um, this December, we'll be having a genetic symposium with um, a focus on the bull and how to select bull and what tools are out there. It's really geared towards our seed stock producers here in the area, um, but we've got a good lineup of speakers. Troy and Matt are both um, scheduled to speak here in December for the symposium and um, it's our first symposium. So I'm in a little under two months to get that put together. So I'm definitely in the uh, little bit of the stressed out phase for that. But it looks, I think the lineup's great. We've got a really great schedule. And so I'm looking, really looking forward to this. And um, so, yeah, so if you know of anybody who might be interested, they can go to the website, register. And if they have any questions, they're more than feel, feel free to contact me. And so with that, that's my contact information. 
If anybody has any questions, comments, happy to take them. Okay, thank you, Randy. Uh, appreciate appreciate that, and uh, nothing uh, nothing wrong with the plug of that meeting at the end. Uh, the meeting you're hosting there in Ames will be directly in front of the genetic prediction workshop hosted by the Beef Improvement Federation uh, that Troy mentioned in Kansas City um, the the couple of days following that. So, uh, could be a great opportunity for folks um, if they want to attend all. Um, and then also, uh, you mentioned beef on dairy there towards the end. Uh, of course, uh, Randy led um, uh, the part of the Beef Improvement Federation guidelines uh, focused on uh, beef on dairy mating. So I uh, encourage you to, to take a look at that on the Beef Improvement Federation website. Um, the, to, to round out uh, today, we're going to ask uh, Troy to come back and, uh, and formally invite us uh, to the Beef Improvement Federation annual symposium uh, that he and colleagues will be hosting in 2024. So with that, Troy. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, again to invite everybody to, to come to Knoxville, Tennessee um, next year to our, our Beef Improvement Federation annual symposium. Um, those dates are going to be June 10th through the 13th hosted on the, the campus of the University of Tennessee. Um, we'll be breaking in a, a brand new 500-person um, conference center in one of our, our new buildings here on the Ag Campus. So we're, we're really excited to, to show off some of the good work that's, that's going on at Tennessee surrounding beef cattle genetic improvement and beef cattle production in general, um, and, and really happy to have BIF back um, in the fescue belt. So the, the big picture topic, I guess, for this year's symposium um, that we settled on is breeding a more effective cow for volatile markets and environments. Um, and so we were just at the at the BIF annual meetings, I guess that's been two weeks ago now, uh, really hammering out the, um, the program for this upcoming symposium. I think it's going to be a, a great combination of, of things that are very relevant to our folks here in the um, in the fescue belt in the southeast, we're very much a cow-calf state um, and a cow-calf region, but we know that the, the challenges from an environmental standpoint, from making animals fit this, um, this sort of uh, different marketing um, world that we're living in right now, um, and, and all the moving pieces that, that go into to making this commercial cow the foundation for a, a profitable beef operation, we're, we're really trying to focus our attention there. So as always, BIF is, is a great combination of, of cutting edge science, um, but also some very practical things to take back to the ranch. So we, we hope that, that the program that we've put together, we've got a, a committee of something like 15 people from extension here in Tennessee, as well as a, a big Kentucky contingent, knowing that our, our two states are very closely aligned in, in the way we raise cattle and market cattle and breed cattle. Um, we're, we're very happy to have Kentucky and Tennessee working um, largely together to put this program um, to put this program together, um, as well as producers across the state and in other industry interest groups that are, are helping us out on the program as well. Um, we're uh, again, Knoxville, Tennessee is is going to be the home to BIF. Um, Tennessee, it turns out, is a, a long state. We've got a lot of variation in our production systems from the western part of the state that looks very similar to uh, to more of the Midwest, some some row crop ground, rolling hills and cattle up on the plateau, which is is going to be much cooler um, in in more temperate climate, but a, an excellent place to to raise cows. And then as we get into the, the Tennessee Valley and, and into, the, um, into the Appalachian Mountains, um, another really unique environment. So again, we're very good at growing grass across the state, um, but we have some unique challenges that I think are, are representative of a number of different um, microclimates and in, in production environments across the country. Um, uh, again, we've got a, a great beef industry here. 
um, supportive groups from our Department of Agriculture to Farm Bureau um, to a cooperative um, extension has played a big role here. Um, and our Tennessee Cattlemen's Association has been in very supportive as well. So um, a big ecosystem of folks making this happen. Um, we hope that if you're you're coming from afar to BIF, know that you can fly directly into McGee Tyson Airport in Knoxville. Um, you can connect to about anywhere in the world. Um, from there, it's got something like 20 or 25 flights out a day um, to, to major hub airports on, on all of the major airlines. So again, don't feel like you've got to fly into Nashville and drive over. We've got a great small airport um, in, the, in, the, in the backyard here that'll get you to Knoxville. Um, this is the building. Um, the, the brand new conference center will be in here. We're very excited to, um, to have a great space to host the, the symposium. And we, we hope you'll make a trip out of it, whether that's spending some time in, in Nashville or Dollywood, making the trip over to, to Lynchburg and seeing what Jack Daniels is, is cooking up in the, in the hills, um, or just in the, the backyard here um, of Knoxville is the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. It'd be America's most visited national park and a, an absolutely beautiful place to go any time of the year. So if any of these appeal to you, um, two of them appeal to me. I won't say which ones, um, but uh, it's, a, it, it's a great place to, to make a trip out of, of coming and learning a little bit about beef cattle, genetic improvement, and, um, and spending some time with the family outdoors. Um, and I think I may have just overshot there. Um, yeah, so again, the dates, we're, we're excited to have you in Knoxville, June 10th through the 13th of 2024. We'll be um, advertising widely across industry publications, and um, the BIF Symposium website will be updated here um, in quick order so that we can start uh, publishing and publicizing um, some of the, the more specifics about the program and whatnot. Um, but we hope you'll join us. Um, as usual, there will be a, a Young Producer Symposium, um, which is, is not just for young producers on, on that first half day. Two full days of, of programming from, from you know, eight until five or so. And then uh, um, our final day will be a tour through East Tennessee. We've got a, a bunch of really cool and diverse stops that I think highlight our, our industry here in the east part of the state quite well. So we hope that you'll make the trip over to Knoxville. We're really excited to have BIF back in our, in our backyard. Um, if you've got questions or if you want to be involved more formally, um, with the, the program or the planning, please let me know. I, I'd be happy to, to talk to you about that. And, and thanks again, Matt, for giving us um, the ability to, to do some friendly advertising here. Well, you bet, Troy. I'm, I'm certainly excited uh, for the, the BIF meetings in Tennessee next year. Um, those dates are on my calendar for sure, and, and I hope after today those dates are on a lot of other people's calendars as well. Um, looks like uh, we do have uh, one question. So uh, ask where the details posted for genetic prediction workshop. John, those aren't yet, but my understanding um, from the, the chair of that planning committee is that those details should be up on the Beef Improvement Federation website relatively soon. I can't give you a specific day, but uh, certainly the Beef Improvement Federation websites where you'll find those details. Um, so with that, I'd just like to, to thank the group uh, for your participation in this year's webinar series. Um, and uh, there'll be an evaluation survey uh, circulated to registrants, and, and we kindly ask that you give us your thoughts on this year's programs and specifically suggestions for next year's topics. We take those suggestions very seriously uh, when we try to build um, the next year's uh, program. And the recordings from this year will be made available both on the NBC EC website and also on eBeef. Um, uh, once uh, once those are, are done and edited. So again, uh, if you haven't, please visit our website um, where you can find uh, not only past recordings of this series, but also other educational material. So with that, very much thank you for your uh, participation today um, and uh, your participation throughout uh, the month of October in this year's Brown Bagger webinar series. So with that, thank you and uh, take care.